Okay, so we're going to get started with the third lecture. We're almost there. Three out of four. So uh, last time, uh, previously in arithmetic statistics, we, uh, we were trying to classify binary quadratic forms according to what primes they represent. You can do the same to represent numbers in general, but the primes was good enough for us. Um, and uh, to do that, what we did is take all the binary quadratic forms and line them up in families according to their SL2Z orbit. A couple of questions came up, and I just wanted to clarify two things. One, somebody asked, is this an associative law? And I had like stage fright, and uh, I didn't know what to say. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, it, it is, of course, associative, just because matrix multiplication is associative, and um, the way the, the law is defined, the, the action. And second, somebody pointed out that, well, why aren't you doing a GL2Z action? <laughs> and you can do that. Uh, and that is um, it, the outcome at the end is a little bit different. The outcome of the class is a little bit different. And in the, the interpretation, our goal now is to relate this to actual class groups of quadratic fields. The interpretation on that other side becomes also different. So uh, what we've done here with SL2Z equivalence, what I was doing last time, that is what Gauss called proper equivalence. And then if you are changing by a uh, matrix with the term minus one, that's called, uh, he called improper equivalence. And uh, if you're just doing all of GL2Z, that's wide equivalence. And uh, what will happen is that uh, if you've uh, seen class groups in, uh, before, proper equivalence corresponds to narrow class groups, and wide equivalence uh, corresponds to the wide class group or the ideal class group. And uh, the thing is that we've also been restricting ourselves to the easier case of negative discriminants. For quadratic imaginary fields, the narrow class group and the class group are the same thing. You need... Uh, real embeddings to see a difference between the two things. Uh, so uh, you, 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 this, the, both things at the end give you the same answer for negative discriminant. Okay. Yes. What is it? If you act on F. So you said, I think you said it could be F, F of F times F, actually not as well. Uh, so going from the second to third end of the function, so then wouldn't end first go in? Yeah, it should be an interesting. So if you act. In, from the second to the third, did I mess this up again? Um, so, n acting. So from the second to the third, I'm I'm simplifying the action of m, and that gives me uh, my new variables. But then I would have to reinterpret that in terms of the other variables, and then. Um, all right, we'll try again in, in lecture number four. Okay, also previously, uh, we had, um, we were reducing forms. We were trying to classify what classes of forms are there. And what we did is, uh, well, we didn't do it, uh, Gauss did it, uh, that there is a reduced form in every equivalence class of binary quadratic forms. And uh, not only that, Gauss also gives you a algorithm to go from a, um, uh, a some binary quadratic form to the reduced form, and those were the steps, and there are exercises about doing that. And then we moved on to ideal class groups uh, or to um, uh, uh, looking at um, uh, rings of integers of quadratic uh, fields and notice that if you take norms of ideals, those norms uh, give you uh, are sort of evaluations of quadratic forms. And then to, to try to match whether an ideal is principal or not, then you can compare. And like if you go through that argument, 
then you see that you're comparing values of two different quadratic forms. And uh, if you know that those two quadratic forms represent different numbers, then they cannot be the same form. And therefore, uh, you get that this equality was impossible to begin with. And we proved this way that P2, that, the, I, that ideal over 2, is not principal. Okay. So uh, what I was going to do next is go the other way around also that uh, Gauss reduction also gives you a way to uh, show in what class of an ideal class group a given ideal goes to. Uh, this is something that if you don't know about the binary quadratic forms, as I said at the end of last lecture, this is kind of difficult to figure out where these classes go. But with quadratic forms, if you first... Uh, find what quadratic form is attached to your ideal, then you can reduce that form and in the, uh, along the way, reduce that ideal to some other ideal that you already know. Okay, so for instance, in Q adjoining the square root of minus 5, the ideal 3 uh, uh, in the ring of integers, it actually it splits into two primes. So let's let I be one of those two ideals. Uh, 3 comma 1 plus the square root of minus 5 which if you want to write it in terms of the, um, uh, the discriminant of the, of the ring of integers, which is minus 20, um, you, have, uh, you have it in that format. Okay, so is it equivalent to P2, the ideal uh, over 2? Let's try. So the norms of elements of I in that form are given by uh, that expression. Remember, we, we work that out. If you have an ideal like that, what the norms look like uh, when you have an element that is generated by 3 and 2 plus the square root of 20 over 2, it gives you uh, a number of this form. So there you have a, a, a quadratic form, and this quadratic form is not reduced. So what I'm going to do is reduce that form and use that work of reducing the form, which is like these three as the easiest steps from Gauss, those steps are actually going to tell me how to transform my ideal to get it into some other ideal that is going to be some a small ideal that I know sort of generates the class group. Okay, so here we go. Uh, this form is not reduced, so uh, C is actually less than A, so that's step one. By the way, uh, I, I don't think I was clear enough that uh, Gauss's steps is not like you do one, two, three, and you're done. It's... It depends like where you are. You might land in one first, and then you do one, and then you might have to do one again. And probably not. I think one solves the problem of one, but that sends you to two. You do two, and then you have to go back to one. So it might be one, two, one, two, one, two, three, and, you, and then you are done. But you might have to repeat one and two a bunch of times before you get to the end. Okay? But Gauss showed that this actually uh, decreases. The, 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 the form is decreasing, decreasing, decreasing until you have a reduced form. Okay, so what is actually doing? That, um, that change of variables changes one quadratic form into another in that way, okay? Uh, so it's essentially changing C and A, the coefficients of X uh, a, a square and Y square, and flipping the sign of the middle. And what is that doing in terms of ideals? Now we know that the one on the left are uh, related to norms of elements of the form a comma b plus the square root of d, elements in that ideal. On the right hand side is related to ideal to norms of elements in the ideal generated by c and minus b plus the square root of d. Okay, so how do I go from one to the other? So actually, if you multiply, if you want to have, for instance, um, uh, well, you see that I have minus b plus the square root of d on one side and not the other, so I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of the uh, b plus the square root of d. I multiply through, multiply through both elements by that number, and then remember that b squared minus d is for c, so I can simplify that to be c. So you see that, um, that what I get is that this ideal times a constant gives me this ideal times a constant. So I, I am sort of in the class group, which is up to multiplication by constants. I'm showing that these two ideals are in the same class. Okay? So let's see uh, the upshot. In our case, we wanted to do uh, reduce 3x squared plus 2xy plus 2y squared. I apply uh, 
option one of Gauss's algorithm. And what that tells me is that uh, this ideal that I started with is actually equivalent to this ideal by that method, okay? So just by looking at the quadratic form, it tells me which one of the three steps I should do of Gauss, and that will tell me how to get to the next stage of an ideal that is going to be simpler, um, but just taking some sort of like stuff out in, in, uh, in terms of just a constant. Yes? Do you have like an algorithm to do it just purely on the ideal side instead of like going to the quadratic form? Um, I believe there must be. I, I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. So I, I sh there is some way of doing that. I've never learned a, a very efficient way myself or an easy way to just, on the ideal side, how do you uh, go from one to the other? This is just, this is very nicely algorithmic in that I can easily point out what's my next step that I should be doing. Um, by the way, so, uh, so we are done in here because that was, the ideal over three that I started with, this is telling me that is, it is a constant, whatever, I can simplify that, but I didn't, times the ideal over two that I wanted to compare to. So they are both in the same class of the ideal class group. Okay, so in, in particular, this is not principal because it's in the same class that I have an ideal that we had shown to be non-principal. By the way, there, remember there were three steps in Gauss's algorithm. The first and the third, actually, they do the same thing to ideals, so you get the same result. What happens with the second step? Uh, the second step, remember, it was a change of variables of this form, and uh, that change of variables, what it does is that it transforms this uh, quadratic form into this quadratic form. This quadratic form is associated to norms of elements in this ideal, this quadratic form, if you just look at this, gives you this, and this gives you this part here, is associated to this kind of ideal, but these two ideals are actually identical. They're the same ideal because all I'm doing is, uh, well, I can always add to this element, I can add a multiple of A, and if you uh, add the minus 2K or minus K multiple of A here, with the two appears this, so they are just equivalent. So they are the same ideal. So you are just saying this ideal equals this ideal and you're not doing anything fancy. Okay, so really the first and third steps is when some constant might come out uh, out of the multiplication of, of the sort of like switching ideals. Okay, so what we've done is actually, um, I've essentially hand-waved a proof that I can go both ways from binary quadratic forms I can uh, associate ideals uh, in quadratic fields, and I can go uh, back and, in fact, leads an isomorphism of uh, the quotient of uh, binary quadratic forms of discriminant D with D negative in uh, modulo SL2C with the narrow class group, as I said, the narrow class group of the ring of integers of the quadratic imaginary field. Because we're working with D less than zero, that is actually uh, equivalent to the, or isomorphic to the wide class group of the quadratic imaginary field. So if you were working with uh, real, um, uh, real quadratic fields, then these, that, uh, this isomorphism would not work, um, but you would still have something of this sort. But the methods we use, for instance, we proved that the class number uh, that there were only finitely many options uh, for classes when D was less than zero. We used the fact that there are reduced forms in that case, and we had used in several places that the uh, discriminant was negative, okay? But you can do this. It's a little more complicated in the real case, and you can do sort of like comparisons of the sort of binary quadratic forms and the narrow class group of a real field. Okay. So remember also, we saw that uh, Higner, Baker, and Stark had shown that the values, the negative values of discriminants where the class number was one, was uh, known as this is the nine numbers. Now that we have that correspondence, this also says that for negative discriminants, the only quadratic imaginary fields of class number one are the ones with this uh, square root of one of those numbers, okay? So um, 
that's what we've done. Sort of just like we set up ourselves to like, okay, I'm going to classify all binary quadratic forms in families according to some arithmetic uh, reason, and I ended up classifying some, uh, some giving you like very concrete uh, data about like, okay, I, now I know exactly when it can be one. Um, uh, just something that apparently was, uh, a, a priori was very different, but it turned out to be the same thanks to this organization of the binary quadratic forms. Yes? So it seems a little strange that it is on there because it's not prime and the other ones are. Uh, and I'm wondering what the like interpretation of that could be. Um, well, four is not a prime either. Oh, uh, that, that's because we, we, ha we are talking about uh, fundamental discriminants. So, of course, if I'm talking about the square root of minus eight, that's the square root of minus two, or Q adjoined the square root of minus eight is like Q adjoined the square root of minus two. I'm listing fundamental discriminants, so they are congruent to zero or one modulo four. If I wrote minus two, then it would not be congruent to zero or one modulo four. So I'm listing the um, fundamental discriminants. Yep. Yes. So the reason that you need to write it as cost in class is because it also holds for the product, which was Excuse me, could you say that again? If a D is positive, yeah. do you still have a equivalence? Do you still have a formula like that? You, you can still um, study the narrow class group in terms of binary quadratic forms, but not the, the so if you want to study the wide class group, then you have to do the equivalence with GL2Z. Then you get, you get more, um, uh, what is it? The, uh, the class group is a quotient of this, so you are, you are doing a wider equivalence and then you get less classes. But it turns out that with a negative discriminant, you, you don't gain anything. You don't have any new classes if you mod by GL2Z. OK? OK, so now the question is, OK, uh, now I, we were talking about, OK, the real quadratic fields are a little more difficult, but I still want to understand their quadratic, uh, their ideal class groups. In particular, I want to know the list of Higner, Baker, Stark, but for real quadratic fields, how often uh, is there a finite list where the class number is one, or what is the list? So the conjecture is that there are infinitely many values where this is one. It's a completely different picture, but we do not know. Uh, we can't prove there are infinitely many such values. Uh, and of course, then we don't have a full list or description of when the class number would be one. And this is where uh, heuristics have to come into play to start trying to get a glimpse of what's happening. Okay. So Gauss did conjecture that there are infinitely many number fields with class number one, and that's also something that is not known. So we don't know it even for real quadratics. Uh, we don't know it in general uh, for uh, class groups of just number fields. By the way, somebody asked me for a reference of all this material that I've condensed in, in just like a few minutes, uh, the uh, beautiful exposition uh, primes of the form x squared plus n y squared, David Cox, who gave a talk here in 2016 at CTNT. Um, this is a, a great book, and the first uh, chapters gives uh, an overview of the whole theory that is very comprehensive with a lot of other references, uh, and it's, it's very much a pleasure to read the whole thing. So I uh, highly recommend it. Okay, so let's switch to ideal class groups. Let's try to understand what happens with those real quadratic fields. Um, but I'm actually going to first try to understand what happens with imaginary quadratic fields uh, for larger discriminants and then try to move on to the real ones. I will not say a lot about the real ones at the end, but a little bit. Okay, so for instance, the class group of Q adjoined the square root of minus five is generated by two classes, the trivial class and the class of, for instance, the, that prime above two. Okay, so we're going to consider uh, all the class groups together. 
I'm going to run through fundamental discriminants, negative fundamental discriminants that are D uh, is 0 or 1 mod 4, put them all in a set, and now I'm going to, I want to know how often each one appears. Okay? How would we go about that? Uh, so what finite abelian groups appear? Those we know that these class groups are finite abelian groups. So which ones will appear? How often will I see each group? I'm also going to consider, uh, so just to, as in Tarex, we would like to know also up to a height, uh, what should we expect up to a height? And this is something that uh, you can actually do uh, quite a lot. Gauss already gave an average uh, size of the class group of a quadratic imaginary field. Um, so so that is, there's a lot of work in that direction. So... Uh, in particular, is this a random sequence of finite abelian groups? Well, the answer is no. This is not just some random sequence of uh, finite abelian groups that are not just going to pop in uh, as they like, because there is at least one piece of the class group is very well understood, and it tells you what you will see exactly, which is called genus theory. Again, David Cox's book uh, has a, a beautiful treatment of genus theory, I will just tell you a little bit of, uh, of the outcome of genus theory is that if you have an a, a, a imaginary quadratic field of discriminant D, uh, then the two part of the class group, and that by that I mean, so by this symbol I mean the two torsion of the class group is exactly known. Is the R minus one copies of Zima two where R is the number of distinct prime divisors of D, where D is the fundamental discriminant. So, for instance, uh, we know this, that the class group of the square root of minus 20, the square root of minus 5, is Z mod 2. And that is actually, well, the, the fact that it's exactly Z mod 2 does not come from genus theory, but the 2 part, which is this part of, so the, the Z mod 2 part comes from genus theory, because in here there are two divisors, 2 and 5, so there are two divisors, R is 2, or 2 minus 1 is 1, so that we expect that there will be the 2 part has to be Z mod 2. Okay, so, uh, so the sequence of class groups is not random at all, or at least the 2 part of the class group is not random because it's di dictated by what's called genus theory, which again has a beautiful explanation through uh, binary quadratic forms. Okay, so uh, this is not random, but what if... A I forget about, I know that the two part has uh, an explanation, it has a reason to be behave in a very particular way. What about the odd part? There is no reason uh, why there would be a, a, a prime order element in the class group coming from qu binary quadratic forms. So there, maybe those are random. Okay, so let's do that. Let's take um, the class groups, then uh, look at the, primary, two primary component of the class groups, and mod out that part. So this, we, we know what happens with the two torsion. Uh, since the two torsion is uh, um, constrained, I'm going to get rid of the whole two primary part and look at uh, the, uh, the ideal class group away from two. So all the, uh, the product of all the P primary parts that are not two. What happens with those groups? Then is this a random sequence of finite abelian groups? Well, um, they, uh, Cohen and Lenstra precisely conjectured in 1984 that this sequence ordered by the size of the discriminant uh, behaves like a random sequence of finite abelian groups of all order. Okay. But the big question is, what is a random finite abelian group? What are you talking about? Uh, I could, you know, that's, that's very nice, but like, what does it mean to be a random of finite abelian? I can, like, I don't have a hat of finite abelian groups to pull from. So uh, how are you pulling uh, groups out of a hat? Uh, well, it is a group with random P part. Okay, you're avoiding the question. Uh, <laughs> The p part is random, okay, so uh, right now we're then 
uh, talking about finite abelian P groups. What is a random finite abelian P group? Um, so, for instance, here is uh, three, the, well, the three abelian groups of order P cubed, there are three of those. Uh, which one is more likely? How are you telling them apart? Let's see how they did it. So what they say, their heuristic is more precise than what is quoted up there. It says, uh, so I'm going to be refining this in a, in a few slides. Let P be a prime. Then assume that we have a natural and biased stochastic process producing finite abelian P groups. So it's really a big hat and you're pulling groups out of a hat with no other constraints. Uh, it's really stochastic, so it's really random, a random process. So they are assuming that that's the case with the class groups, that there is no other constraints other than pulling them at random. So suppose you have one of those. Then if we fix a finite abelian group G, then the probability that an output of the process that is isomorphic to G is inversely proportional to the size of the automorphism group out G. So it's not, for instance, you could say, okay, it's going to be more difficult to find groups that are by the size of the group. They don't say it's inversely proportional to the size of the group. It's actually inversely proportional to the automorphism size. Okay. Um, all right. Why that? Let's uh, postpone that question. Let me uh, give you a, a refresher if you've ever seen this. How big is an automorphism group? So uh, an automorphism group. Um, if you have an abelian group, the, the structure theorem of finite abelian groups tells you that if you have a P group, then it's going to be of this shape. Um, highlighted. That was a nice sound. Okay, so it's going to be a product of, uh, of cyclic groups of powers of P, right? And then there's going to be, uh, so this is just saying that there's K, uh, K is a product of K cyclic groups. Uh, well, not really K cyclic groups of each kind. And then there is that many uh, of, uh, of each kind. All right. So we have um, a description of what a finite abelian P group is. And then it just tells you a formula. You can prove this. I'll, I'll put as an exercise to prove a, a few of these cases if you've never done this. Um, so that you compute the automorphism group, the size of the automorphism group. You, if you know what the automorphism group is for each of these components, then you can sort of like recompose the automorphism group of the whole thing. All right, let's see some examples. So, for instance, the, remember we had three groups of order P cubed. So let's see what those automorphisms are like. So this is saying that there is exactly one copy of a cyclic group. Uh, that is P cubed, so that EI is this three here, it's three, and that R1, so there's only just one copy really of this type of cyclic group. Okay, so then you can apply the formula. The formula tells you there's going to be first in this product, K is one, so I just do one term of one minus P to the minus one times this. This is the, the index go between 1 and k, I take any value between 1 and k. Uh, k is 1, so i is 1, j is 1, e is 1, e1 is 3, so it's 3 times 1 times 1. And then you can see that that's the formula. You can simplify that formula, and you get p minus 1 times p squared. Okay, that's, that's a lot to say that, well, we know what the automorphism group of z mod p cube is, is uh, z mod p cube cross. Okay, uh, but Z mod P cubed cross uh, phi of P cubed is P minus 1 times P squared. So that's why we get this. Okay, now, now I understand why I'm getting that. That's phi of P cubed. Okay, good. Let's see another example. How about this one? So this one, the formula says that there is uh, one type of cyclic group. The R tells you there is three copies of the same type. And the E1 is saying that it's just a cyclic of P to the first power, all three copies. So you can do the same. Now there's K is uh, 1, but R1 is 3. So I get uh, three copies of this factor with increasing exponent. 
And then in here, there is 1 to k. Uh, k is just 1, so there's only one factor. The e is 1, and then 3 times 3, so I get this product. Okay, I think I hopefully I did it right. So I get this automorphism group. So it has a very large automorphism group. Now, what is this? This group is, uh, this is a, a field in three variables, right? It's a three-dimensional FP vector space. The automorphism group of that is GL3 of Z mod P. So you can actually compute their formulas for GLN of Z mod PZ. You Google it, it's there. And then you can compute and then understand that, like, okay, this formula actually comes out of, that's the size of an automorphism group of, of well, the size of GL. Okay. All right. Then you can also compute the automorphism group of the third one. Uh, so the third one comes out to be like this, and it's P minus 1 squared times P cubed. Okay. So let's compare automorphism groups. For P equals 5, I computed all three. And then you see that the automorphism group of uh, this one, the one that was a vector space in three dimensions, is ginormous, and the one that is uh, cyclic is a little bit small. All right? So there is a very different um, size of these automorphism groups, and they are all of size p cubed. Okay? So this is going to tell me that this is very rare, while well, this is going to be quite a bit more abundant than this according to the coin lens heuristics. All right. So uh, what does the, uh, the coin lens heuristics say again? That's, uh, that's where it is. Um, so let's, let's do it a little bit more formally. Uh, so what it says is, okay, let's take GP to be the set of all finite abelian groups, uh, finite P groups, and then the coin Lenstra weight, omega, is the measure on the set, GP, such that the measure of one element is one over the automorphism group, the size of the automorphism group. If the uh, weight of the whole space, according to this, was one, this would be the probability. But we have to account... Is this, is that right? Is the weight of the whole space one? And it's actually not. Okay, so we have to uh, be careful with that. So the local, local meaning that I'm doing the measure of the probability. So you see that I'm just doing the probability of P parts of class groups at the moment. Okay, so the probability uh, locally meaning the probability of one P group or one P primary part to be something that is the coinless or probability measure P is the probability measure on GP that is obtained by scaling omega by the size of the entire space. So you have to also account for, okay, what is the, the measure of the entire set of all P groups? And if you do that, it does not come to one it comes out to be a formula like this. It's the product from 1 to infinity of uh, the inverse of 1 minus p to the minus i. But we have a, a formula for that. Okay, so I can go back to my example now. I can compute the weight of the entire space of five groups, of a billion five groups. That's the weight of, or the measure of the entire space, 1.31. I know from before the measure of each of the automorphism groups. And therefore, I can compute the probability now of each one of those appearing as a random abelian group. It's going to be the measure of the group divided by the measure of the entire space of P groups. So uh, the measure of the cyclic group is about 0.0076 or 0.76% of the times you will see this group. That group uh, the by uh, the two-dimensional group, this one appears with 0.038% chance, while the, uh, the, the vector space, sort of like the, the, the cube of the cyclic group, that appears with a probability of 0.000051%. So it is very rare compared to this one. Okay. Um, all right. 
But again, why this measure? Why, why are they picking this measure? Why not just the size of the group? Why, why I mean, I, I computed probabilities according to what they tell me, but I don't understand yet why would this probability be better than any other? I, why not just do one over the size of G? If I have a big cat and all the groups are there, it seems I'm going to be able to pick them out with the same probability if they are the same size, right? Why, why one over the other? Why this measure? Well, uh, why is this measure the correct measure? Uh, so how do you expect abelian groups to arise? Uh, here's one way of doing this. You can uh, remember uh, P groups are of this form. So why don't we pick a random K, random RI, and random EI? That will give me groups. Is that natural? Does that look good to you? It shouldn't look good uh, because <laughs> some people consider this to be unnatural, um, as the emperor would say, because you are using the full strength of the structure theorem of finite abelian groups. Do you, do you start group theory by saying, like, well, this is a P group? Let's now prove things. No, you start like, okay, this is a, a P group. It's just like the order is divisible only by P. It's a power of P. That's all I know. And then you spend all this time developing silo theorems and this and this and that to prove something of this sort, right? So uh, we are assuming a lot of knowledge, and the way we organize our groups now according to our structure theorem, it's sort of like not the way groups should ap appear in nature. Okay, so uh, instead, what we're going to do is let us model random generators and relations. What you should think is that, okay, we have a finite abelian group, then you should think of presentations of groups. A presentation of a group is, okay, how many generators are there? Are there R generators? Okay, now bar, give me the relations. This is actually how you define sort of an abstract group in magma, say. You have to tell the how many generators are going to be, and then how many relations are there, what are the relations. So think about it that way, that in nature, uh, how are we related? Well, we are sort of independent events, but somehow maybe we are related through our parents or cousins or something, so these sort of like relations happen, and there may be some connection between us. So sort of that's more natural to think about just think about generators, and let's come up with a way to come up with gener random relations and see where that gets us. All right, so let's do that instead. And the emperor approves. Okay, so uh, we start with R generators. So let's start with uh, just an infinite abelian group, a free group in R generators. I'm going to choose R random relations. So relations in a group is going to be just a linear combination of the generators G1 through GR, and I'm going to pick R of those relations, and I'm going to put them, I'm going to organize my relations in a matrix uh, form. So each relation, each one of these relations is uh, written here as a column, okay? So what I'm doing for random, I mean, somehow I'm going to pick random uh, numbers, EI, and see what that gets me. So what is my group going to be? It's going to be Z mod, uh, ZR modulo these relations. If you think about this as a vector space, then uh, it's going to be the vector space, or not a vector space, a module, uh, modulo these relations, the sort of like the ideal generated by these relations, okay? Or the submodule generated by these relations, yes? Be careful about choosing the same relation twice. Yes, we should. So I do want, uh, so the question was, should we be careful that we're not repeating a relation or not even repeating? What you're asking is, shouldn't this rank be uh, full? Otherwise, what happens? I, I, I'm going to get an infinite group, right? I'm trying to get finite abelian groups. So if this matrix does not have full rank, I do not get a, a full, uh, I do not get a finite group. Okay, so that, that's a problem. But that problem will actually take care of itself. 
So as you will see in a moment. So I'm going to mod out ZR modulo, the space generated by the column, so the column space of R, which is, if you think about this as a map, is the image of that map. Um, but this is not a P group in general. Uh, so that's a problem. We're hoping to model um, P groups. This might be a nice way to generate uh, random abelian groups, not P groups, just random finite abelian groups. This is one way of doing it, which feels very natural in that I'm not picking uh, winners and losers of powers of P and cyclic groups. You know, the other a natural way, it just seems it favors uh, cyclicity uh, in one way or another. But in any case, it's just picking and it's not even acknowledging that there is a structure theorem. It's just picking relations and trying to see what I come up with. Okay, so, uh, so now instead of uh, Z, because I want P groups, I'm actually going to use the P addicts so that every other prime that is not P is going to be invertible in ZP and all the finite possible uh, torsion of prime to P is actually going to be invertible. It's everything is going to vanish, okay? Or everything is going to be trivialized if it's away from P. So if you haven't seen the PRX, uh, um well, I don't know what to tell you. Um, so if you haven't seen the PRX, just uh, just imagine um, we're talking, do this over FP, okay? To begin with, or FP and then Z mod P squared, Z mod P cubed, and then just figure that you can do that um, for larger and larger powers of P. Okay, so uh, what, where is this group? As I was saying, this matrix can be thought as a map, uh, as a module homomorphism from ZPR to ZPR, given by this matrix, and then we have a kernel, and we have a co-kernel. As long as the, so with this in mind, the co-kernel, I want it to be finite, so that will happen also. I, I want this um, to be a full rank, okay? So there might be a kernel, um, but I want this to be a, a, a full rank matrix. All right, so, um, so here is the, the group that I wanted to model is these co-kernels. All right, so then we have our correspondence now of finite abelian P groups and matrices. Then, so I can model all this whole thing by this matrix. Matrix is in uh, R by R in ZP with full rank. Yes? Are chosen randomly or do you put it in? Is this an input? The what? The R in the very... The little R. So the little R for now is I've, I've chosen the little R. And what's going to happen is that R is going to go to infinity. Okay. okay. Uh, some of these relations will say, like, I mean, the relation could be just that it's going to kill generators. So, so some of the generators might, uh, some of the relations might kill generators, and we'll, we won't have, like, R copies of ZP all the time if you have little R. So it will, uh, the R will go to infinity uh, in a moment. Okay, so, uh, uh, but how do I pick a random matrix? Uh, so ZP is compact, so you can talk about topology on ZP. Uh, you can put a topology, the profinite topology on ZP. With that topology, ZP is compact, so it has a hard measure, and uh, we can normalize it, so the total volume of ZP is one, so it's a probability measure, and then ZP, uh, of matrices in ZP with, uh, or R by R matrices with coefficient in ZP, then inherits that uh, measure from ZP. So I have a measure, and I can talk about the probability of um, matrices appearing, okay? Or subsets of matrices. Uh, I can start talking about probabilities of subspaces and subsets of these sets of matrices. Okay, so what happened was that after uh, uh, Coyne and Lenstra uh, proposed their heuristics in 84. Uh, Eduardo Friedman and Lawrence Washington, Larry Washington, uh, proved the following. So for a randomly chosen matrix, R by R matrix, with respect to the Haar measure, 
it turns out that the probability that R has full rank is one. So your concern was valid, accepted, but now I disregard it in terms of probability. If I pick a random set of relations, the rank is going to be full uh, with 100% probability. So I can just forget about it that I'm going to get most of the time full rank and when I quotient by uh, the column space of that matrix, then I'm going to get a finite, uh, a finite group. And uh, for any finite abelian peer group you pick, G, we have that the probability that the co-kernel of R is isomorphic to G, that the quotient of ZP to the R modulo the column space of R is G, tends to the coin Lenstra probability measure as R goes to infinity. So you, you were saying about R, so as you make the matrices larger and larger and larger, not for a small matrices, if you only fix R equals three, this may not be true because you are, now you're fixing yourself and you cannot have more than three generators. The dimension of your abelian group by number of cyclic groups cannot be bigger than three if you fixed R equals three. So if you let R go to infinity, then there may be um, larger and larger groups, but also things might cancel out and you get a small group sometimes. But the point is that in this natural way, you actually see the coin lens for heuristic appear. Okay, out of random relations. So that's cool. I think that's uh, very exciting that you see it like that. But it turns out also that the, the weight by one over the size of the automorphism group that appears, that has appeared in several instances, not just in this heuristics. There's other ways in that uh, when you're talking about lattices, quadratic forms in other contexts of quadratic forms and elliptic curves, this measure actually has uh, appears in other places where it actually makes sense and you can uh, go a long way by looking at this sort of weight on how often things should appear. Uh, there is also a lot of data uh, that supports the coin lens strike heuristics. So Stephens, uh, Stevens and uh, Williams, Jacobson, Lukes and uh, Williams and Jacobson, they have uh, produced data in the hundreds of millions of class groups uh, that, that support this. More recently, Melanie Wood, for instance, has uh, some papers on... Uh, doing coin and Lenstra over function fields, improving that over there. Some of these things uh, happen also over function fields. And there is, there is a massive amount of work about coin and Lenstra, including a, a recent paper of, uh, um, it's the first uh, author, but Lenstra and a co-author where they actually correct the coin Lenstra heuristic. That apparently there are some uh, mistakes, that some problems that may occur it actually, one of the things that they point out is that the counting of, uh, of class fields, of, uh, of ideal class groups, should be done instead of by the size of the discriminant, it should be by the radical of the discriminant. So there is, uh, if you see uh, a recent paper on Lenstra on this, read that and read in the introduction how they say, like, you, we might want to count quadratic fields differently not just by the size of the discriminant, but the size of the radical of the discriminant. So then, like, um, essentially the product of the prime dividing the discriminant. Okay, so what happens for uh, real quadratic fields? So, uh, so the coordinates for heuristics for real quadratic fields are a little bit different. I've told you the story for the imaginary quadratic fields. For real quadratic fields, again, the difference between the narrow and the wide class group uh, you have to account for that, and uh, the modeling is a little bit different. It's the narrow class group that essentially appears as a random group, but then for the wide class group, you have to model the narrow class group and then quotient it by a random cyclic group to get down to the wide class group, okay? But you can do it, and for instance, they get the following uh, uh, conjecture or heuristic out of it, that, uh, so if K is an odd number, then the probability that the odd part of a class group of a real quadratic field, and we're gonna call the odd part, so just factor a class number as two to a power times something odd, so H star would be the odd part. So the odd part of the class number is H star, 
So the class number will be a number k is given by this probability, a constant c times lambda k over k, where this is the constant c and lambda k, or the inverse of, is given by this product. So for instance, um, so this says that the odd part of the class number will be one about 75% of the time for real quadratic fields, okay? Um, but it, it turns out that, uh, well, if you assume that the real quadratic fields with prime discriminant or uh, just the square root of P, that that behaves like the whole family, which uh, you, might, you might disagree that, okay, this is a very special subfamily. We might not see exactly the same. It looks like they follow sort of like the same um, um, pattern. So let's assume that the same heuristic applies to do the subfamily of Q agenda square root of a prime. If it behaves similarly there, well, it turns out that in there, you can actually show that H star equals H. The, the class number is odd, so the, it doesn't matter what happens with the even part of the class number, H star equals H. So that heuristic tells you that uh, the class number of uh, quadratic real field with a square root of P should be one about 75% of the time. Remember that we cannot even prove that there are infinitely many real quadratic fields with class number one. This says that there's a lot of them, but we cannot prove that there are infinitely many. That's not known. So this is a, it is a very impressive heuristic, and again, it coincides with the statistics that we see, and then you can try with the databases that Harris was talking about. Uh, with Magma, you can do that, just figure out, just f grab all the quadratic, real quadratic fields that are in the database and look at the class number and see how many times it's one, and I, uh, it should, you should see something like this. Okay, so I think I'm done for today. Thank you.